Hey guys, today I'm going to be talking about Transformers. My guess is that there's going to be two types of people that watch this video. One has some basic understanding about how Transformers work, has some experience with circuit design, but just wants to solidify their knowledge. Or maybe they just want to learn more. But the second type of person is probably someone that sees a Transformer as an object with mystical free energy powers that is capable of turning low voltage into super high voltage. Or the other way around. Someone that wants to use them in a circuit, but just doesn't know how. This video is for both types. Uh, first, I'm going to get into what they are, how they work, and then I'm going to get into why we need them, and how to use them in practical applications. So what is a transformer? It is defined as an apparatus for either increasing or decreasing the voltage of an alternating current. Let me just start off by saying there are a lot of different types of transformers, from power transformers all the way down to piezoelectric transformers. But most of them can fit into one of two categories, step up or step down. The first one, step up, turns a lower voltage with a relatively higher current into a higher voltage with a relatively lower current. So why the drop in current? Well, for two reasons. One, first law of thermodynamics, and two, this is not a free energy device. Power is energy over time. Energy, according to the first law of thermodynamics, cannot be created or destroyed. So if we look at the power equation where power equals voltage times current, and we step up the voltage of an AC wave via transformer, in order for the power to stay the same, the current needs to decrease. Technically, the equation for AC waves is voltage times current times power factor, which looks at the average power over time time because AC waves are prone to changing, but regardless, it's still the same concept. We kind of veered off course there, but the second category of transformer is the step down transformer. It's the opposite of a step up. It takes a higher voltage and lowers it. So let's zoom into the how. How does the transformer take an AC waveform and alter its voltage? So first of all, transformers operate on what's known as electromagnetic induction. It's the production of an electromotive force, also known as voltage, across an electrical conductor in a changing magnetic field. This next part is re really important. So. Induction creates what's known as a non-electrostatic electric field, which in other words means an electric field born out of a changing magnetic field. This electric field will develop perpendicularly to the magnetic field. So for now, just imagine a current carrying wire placed perpendicular to, but inside of, a magnetic field, as in the case of a secondary coil of a transformer. If the wire and the magnetic field are static and unchanging, nothing happens. No current is induced. But as the magnetic field starts oscillating in direction, an electric field builds up on course with the wire and it compels electrons to start moving down the wire. In other words, a current is generated. According to Faraday's law of induction, when the amount of magnetic flux changes throughout the surface of a wire loop, it creates an electromotive force or voltage. The amount of induced electromotive force or voltage in any closed circuit is equal to the rate of change of the magnetic flux enclosed by the circuit. In a transformer, there are usually two coils. One is the primary and the other is the secondary. The primary gets the first AC voltage, and as the AC signal fluctuates in and out of the coil, it creates a fluctuating magnetic field, which has its field lines cross the secondary coil perpendicularly. And as we now know, because the primary coil's magnetic field was changing and its field lines were hitting the secondary coil perpendicularly, a current is induced in the secondary coil. There are a lot of factors that play into how much current is induced in the secondary, like wire thickness, the amount of turns the coils have, and the amount of distance between the primary and the secondary coil. But I want to talk about arguably the most important part of a transformer, the core. In almost all transformers, you'll notice some kind of metal core that someone put there on purpose. Well, having a metallic core there with a high permeability, or the ability to become strongly magnetized, allows for a much, much stronger magnetic field to develop from the primary coil. Both the initial magnetic field emanating from the primary coil Coil and the magnetization of the core contribute to a much larger electric field in the secondary coil. A lot of cores are made out of what's known as soft iron, not only for its high permeability, but also because it can take a lot of magnetization before becoming saturated. Also, it has a low coercitivity, or the ability to hang on to its magnetization. That last part is really important, because we're dealing with alternating current, so the primary coil's magnetic field is constantly changing. If we had a core that retained its magnetic field, it would constantly be playing catch up with the primary's magnetic field, and it would be a massive waste of energy. One problem, though, with having a metallic 
core is eddy currents. The magnetic field coming in from the primary in a hypothetical non-laminated core would cause an electric current to start swirling around inside the core, just like it does in a copper wire. This current creates its own magnetic field that opposes the primary's magnetic field, and thus it would create an annoyingly large waste of energy. This is because more current would be needed to reach the same level of magnetic field strength ultimately going to the secondary coil. So what they do to get rid of this eddy current is they divide and isolate the solid core into layers or laminations parallel to the magnetic field. This eliminates the risk of a larger circulating current in the metal and the subsequent annoying magnetic field. Now let's go back to the coils for a minute. Earlier I said that a coil's number of turns and thickness affected its induced voltage slash current. But how? Well, let's start with wire thickness. Remember that current is just the number of charges that pass by a single point on a wire every second. If we think of a wire as a highway, a thinner wire would be like a two-lane road, and a thicker wire would be like a six-lane road. The six-lane road can support more cars, so thicker wires for the same voltage can support a higher current. With all these electrons available to carry the current, the resistance is lower. In a step-up transformer, the primary wires are usually thicker, and the secondary wires are usually thinner. A big part of why transformers even exist is to save energy. If we can reduce the amount of current coming out of the secondary coil, less energy is wasted to the environment in the form of heat. For step-down transformers, if you want a lower voltage and a higher current coming out of the secondary, it's flipped. Now, affecting voltage, on the other hand, is the number of turns per coil. For a transformer, the higher the number of turns on the secondary, the higher the output voltage is going to be. This is because, as you can imagine, the more loops there are in a coil, the more intersections there will be between the incoming magnetic slash electric field lines and the entire coil. And thus, a larger electromotive force or voltage builds up in the coil. Transformers are usually used for their power applications, and in the late 1800s, that is exactly what they were designed for. In 1885, William Stanley designed a transformer that was practical enough for commercial use, and Westinghouse Electric started using his design in 1886. Before the transformer, power was crappily transmitted medium to long distances using direct current. With direct current, transmitting it to homes or long distances is hard, because really high voltage DC is dangerous, which they needed if they wanted the current to be low, and low voltage wires had to be so thick that it was really impractical. Higher voltage on a skinny wire means less current and less energy is wasted, but it's not like they had a way to step that voltage down once it got to their house, so they couldn't even use it for menial stuff like light bulbs. But today, we use AC power and transformers to get around this problem. For transmitting power to homes, we can step up the voltage to ridiculously high levels and drop the current to save energy, and then step the voltage down when it reaches our homes so it doesn't kill anyone. We use them in wall chargers, microwaves, computers, TVs, other stuff. Our modern world might not exist without them. So engineering wise, what can these things be used for? If you're doing some kind of project and you need really high voltage... Break the law on my watch, will you? I'll be confiscating your stolen goods. Oh, and no gold to pay your fine, hmm? No, but here's the part where I tell you guys to be really careful around high voltage. Be really careful around high voltage. It's not worth it. Use, use rubber gloves if you have to. But if you need really high voltage, you can pull a flyback transformer out of the back of one of your old TVs, or you can pull a chunky one from the back of a microwave. But if you see a capacitor next to one of these things, make sure to discharge it with something connected to ground, preferably with you not touching it. Those chunky boys found in microwaves can output something like 2,000 volts, and it's low frequency, so I would not recommend playing with that. This one time, I, I shorted the two output wires, and it made a loud booming noise, and it scared the sh** out of me. And flyback transformers found in old TVs can output anywhere between like 10 and 30,000 volts. I made a video about them in this one if you want to learn more about them. If you need low voltage AC, you can easily pull the step-down transformer out of an old wall charger. Or if you want 5 to 12 volts DC, you can leave the wall charger intact and just strip down the main wire, where you'll find the positive and negative wires. I have used this method a lot. For things like DC motors, LCD screens, laser modules, speakers, or even for powering my Arduino board when I can't use my computer for a project. It is an insanely useful method. Anyway, that is it for this week's episode. Thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you next time.